there was nothing until God said, now is the time. And suddenly, something, so many things, stars and seas, birds and trees, and so there was creation. Until God said, now is the time. And suddenly, a man, a woman, shaped in his image, made from the earth in his breath, separated by sin nonetheless. And so, there were humans. Until God said, now is the time. And suddenly, a savior, a baby, a son, sent to reunite us and to save everyone. Until God says again, now is the time. On Sunday morning, the alarm goes off. Working the nine to five, but at what cost? Staring at our phones, looking for a picture to post and dose off. Just to let everyone think we're all right. All the while wondering, is there more to life? We're walking out paces with all the other stranger faces. Checking off the things that make us good people. Treat others equal, don't be deceitful, but is there more to life? Just like before, we can hear God implore. Now is the time for hope and connection. Enough for seclusion and rejection. Now is the time for resurrection, for starting over. Enough for the shame. Now is the time to shout and proclaim. I believe there is more. What are you waiting for? It's yours and it's mine. Now is the time for more than just me. Now is time for us and we. Now is time for God's Fam, you can't find it alone, and it goes beyond things that are known. Now is the time to see you are loved. No more pressure, no measure, we're better together. Now is the time to share tragedies and victories with others. No more wondering, no more wandering. Here, there is only belonging. Now is the time. I don't know if any of you are weary and uh, heavy laden and burdened and troubled. I don't know if some of you are tired of fighting and struggling. We, we know that there, is, there seems to be a desire for us to have the church to have the power of God manifest in our lives. There is the need for that, but there's also the hope for that. I don't know if you and I are on the same page, but I want to see God's glory, his manifest power demonstrated in the church and through our lives. I, I want to step into a setting, a scenario where someone's hurting, someone's troubled, someone's sick, someone's dying, and have the power of God to declare life to them and, and to see God then do that work. I want, to, I want to see that happen. He's promised those things. I'll, I'll refer to them again later in the scripture, but as much as we want to see it, the church, I think, very often finds themselves powerless to do what God told us we could or should do. I mean, Jesus said, greater things than I've done, you're going to do. And, and, and whether you want to believe that's an individual mandate or individual call, or whether that's the call to the church at large, and that's what he meant when he said greater things, because there's a whole bunch of us who are the bride of Christ, the body of Christ, and so surely we all together can be anywhere all over this world at any one time where Jesus was limited, he was in the flesh, he can only be at one place, healing one person at one time. If the church was doing what it should, then there should be no reason that right now, right now, across the world, there could be literally hundreds of thousands of miracles taking place because the church has risen up and doing and what God called them to do. So greater things, do you understand that? So what does the church do when those greater things don't happen? We then change scripture. So this last week, I, as a result of last Sunday's preaching, I began to study and prepare for Wednesday night. And, and the, the declaration, this is what I found. There's a, there's a wonderful passage, we know it. It's a passage in Isaiah chapter 53 that says, and by his stripes we are healed. If you don't understand that, that's referring to the whole point of Jesus' death and, and him coming to the cross. He did so to heal us spiritually. And by his death on the cross, by his death, he took our sins and buried them and forgives us and restores us and saves us and heals us spiritually. Do you understand that? Do you agree with that? How many of you have been saved? You know the power of the cross, the power of redemption. You're grateful that you're born again. Okay, you believe that, right? Why did he, why was he beaten? Was beating ever 
a pay for, a, a redemption for sin. It was, the, it, was the, it was the shedding of blood that brings about redemption, not the beating or the bruising, but, but it seemed as though the devil not only wanted to kill Jesus, he wanted to make him suffer beyond anything imaginable. And the Bible tells us that he literally was beaten and scourged. They beat him with a cat of nine tails, nine pieces of, of, of leather with bone and sharp metal or something in the end, pottery. And they, every time they would hit his back, they would rip his, his, his side and his hips. The, the, the truth was that by his stripes, the Bible tells us, those weren't just 39 stripes. They were, they were probably hundreds of stripes. If you multiply every slash times nine, he was, he was so beaten so badly that, that he, was, he was unrecognizable. Nowhere, nowhere was the payment of our sin imperative that he had to be beaten in his head, a crown of thorns on his head, his, peer, his beard plucked. All that was extra that the devil did for him. And I just believe that while the father looked at his son and said, son, are you willing to die for the sins of humanity? And Jesus said, yes. The devil stepped in to say, I'm going to make him more miserable than he's ever thought. And I believe the, the, the father looked down and said, okay, his 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 dying is going to buy their salvation, but his stripes are going to buy them healing. And by his stripes we're healed. Theologians have come and said that is not what the scripture means. That by his stripes we're healed is only talking about spiritual healing. I have to disagree. How could spiritual stripes, how could physical stripes ever produce spiritual healing? It's not, it's not made for that. It was his death that brought us spiritual healing. It was his beating that brought us physical healing. And the word tells us that, that when Jesus was doing miracles, the apostle looks at, at, the, at the miracles and he's, and he's defining it. And he said, and Jesus did these to fulfill the scripture. He was wounded and bruised for our iniquities and chastisement of his peace was upon him. And by his stripes were healed. That's what the apostle said, that Jesus, as he was doing physical miracles, was fulfilling what was yet to come in his life when they would beat him. So don't let anybody steal from you the fact that in heaven there's no sickness and he prays for us that the kingdom of heaven come to earth. And what is true in heaven is in, true on earth. Why we don't get healed, why we struggle with believing and understanding and receiving has nothing to do with the fact that it isn't available. It has to do with the fact of how we take it and how we receive it and how we gain the miracles that we need. Ephesians 6.10 is where I get the emphasis. Be strong in the Lord and the, in his mighty power is what it says in New Living Translation. Be strong. I've, I've called you to wake up. I've called you to fight. But I've called you now. I want you to understand this term, this understanding that you are to wake so that you understand that your strength comes from the power of his might. King James Version says in the power of his might, the Century Standard Version Bible says, by his vast strength. It says in WNT, in the power which his supreme might imparts. And then the Amplified Bible takes a scripture. Uh, I don't know if you know the history of this. The Amplified Bible was put together by a, a sweet Presbyterian lady who had lost her husband in a horrible death and her son the same way. And in her loneliness, she said, I just want to understand the word. And she took the, the Revised Standard Version, and what they did is they, she took every word and began to look every word up in the Strong's Concordance and, and developed the fact that there's so many nuances, there's so many meanings to every word that the Amplified Version tells you what it says by breaking down every word. And so this Amplified Version, by the way, it came in 1958. It's been around a long time. Isn't that amazing? says, be strong in the Lord, draw your strength from him and be empowered through your union with him and in the power of his boundless might. Not bad for a Presbyterian girl. <laughs> but I want to tell you, I like even better the Pentecostal th twist. The most recent Bible that we have translation is done by a wonderful man of Pentecostal brothers named Brian's. Simmons, and he wrote in the Passion Translation, listen to this, 
Now, my beloved ones, I have saved these most important truths for last. Be supernaturally infused with strength through your life union with the Lord Jesus. Stand victorious with the force of his explosive power flowing in and through you. It's so important for us to realize the Lord doesn't call us to wake up, to go to battle, and not be empowered by his grace and love to fix us, to help us, to stand, to fight, to do what we've got to be called to do. You know this passage in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, King James Version, for the weapons of our warfare are not carnal but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalted itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. Let me just say this. If you, if you really look at the scripture closely, you would say it's written to us who live in a world today where truth is not truth, where lie is, is supposedly truth, where up is down and down is up and right is wrong and wrong is right. And we live in a world where every imagination of man as, is propagated as truth and this is how you're going to enjoy life do it your way do life your way it's okay and the only thing you can't do is be critical of anybody else because then you step into this line of being control freaks and the world will not have that so don't tell me truth I don't want to hear it I just want to know what I believe is truth and so I want to live my life the way I want to live it and we realize that to fight that today we live in a society where it is almost impossible. I see, it, I see little memes on Facebook all the time. It's like it's impossible to talk, try to talk to somebody, to tell them truth if they don't want to believe it. We live in a society today that is no, so full of lies and deceit. And I don't know if that wearies you, but it wearies me. It wearies me. It wearies me. It causes me grief and, and, and I'm tired of having to try to deal with life and look at things and say, what is truth here when everything around me is screaming and hollering? That's not truth. Let me read that same passage in the New International Version. For the weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. And we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. Let me just tell you this, that the only hope that you and I have got in the wearisome world that we live in with all of this stuff coming at us from every direction, believe this, believe this, believe this, believe this, and it's all lies, you become weary just in the onslaught of all of that. The only way you're going to find victory is for the Lord to give you the power, the power to understand and to believe that what you know is true. It's truth. It's biblically sound. It's, it's is reported to you by, by one who loves you and tells truth and is truth. The greatest arguments or the greatest pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God is in our own, our, between our own ears. This is where we, the biggest fight happens. If you don't know, it's what I talked about all last Sunday. If we don't know the devices of the enemy, if we don't know what he wants to do against us, that's one thing. But how about this? If we don't know the purposes and the plans and the good things of God, if we don't know that he has the end word, the last word, and if you haven't seen or heard the last word yet, I'm telling you, just read in the scriptures, you'll find he has the last word. And his word will always be true. So we're... We're humans, but we're not, we're not supposed to fight all the stuff that's going on in our world with human thinking and human ways and human reasoning. We have to be continuing in this thing of being awake, of being alert, of watching, of fighting. And I don't know about you, but I wish it would just be a real quick thing. I mean, I, I want to get saved. Take the enemy down and just have fun. I want to enjoy my Christian walk. And I have found out the longer I live for the Lord, 
that even though there's joy in the journey, there is constant fighting. And spiritually, this is not, this is not just a sprint. This is a marathon. We have to keep running, keep running. My wife will get up in the morning and get ready, and we'll go downstairs. And usually an hour, hour and a half later, I come downstairs after spending my time in my devotions and preparing and getting ready in the morning. And she will be on her knees or in her, in her schoolroom over her desk, and she'll be praying. And she will have been there for at least an hour praying. And it'll extend for an hour to an hour and a half to two hours of Bible study, prayer, crying out the Lord. And you know what? I don't believe I ever, I ever slip in on her that I don't hear your names. She prays for everybody and every need. And she does so every day. Every day. She doesn't miss a day. Maybe Sunday when she comes here. And then she starts praying and doesn't quit till the day's over. If I was sick, if I was hurting, if I was down, I would never want anybody else to pray for me more than I want my wife to. Because she's a prayer warrior. <clears throat> and I'll be, I'll be honest with you. Um, when we pray together, very often she'll take the lead and begin to pray in English. And while she's doing it, I'm just praying in the Holy Ghost because I can't keep up with her. I, I mean, she is she she can say it so so succinctly, but yet so beautifully. And she'll pray in English, and I'll be praying in the Holy Ghost. And uh, when she quits, I'll start, take over in English, and she'll pray in the Holy Spirit. And I, I'll be honest with you, prayer warriors like that are not people who win battles necessarily in a quick fashion. It's heavy duty long-term intercession, laying siege against the enemy. And most of us, we just want it to be done quickly, and we say a little two-second prayer and figure God's going to do it. If he's going to do it, que sera, sera, and we go on our way. But I'm telling you that God's calling us to prayer right now in our world that is going to take time. It's going to take laying siege against the enemies. Galatians chapter 6 Verse 9 says, let us not lose heart in doing good, for in due time we'll, we will reap if we do not grow weary. Do you grow weary? Weariness is not necessarily a sin, but he's telling us if you hang in there, it's going to work out. You will reap if you don't quit. There, there are two words for time. The two words are chronos and kairos. Chronos is where we get chronograph, chronography. Chronos means just a, is just time as it comes and goes. Okay? Time that is measurable but not necessarily ending. It's just what starts and continues. The word kairos, though, means a specific time, a specific event in the midst of a chronos time. So when something starts, there comes a moment where it comes to a head, a specific moment. In fact, I, I defined it two ways. Chronos is a period of time versus kairos, which is a specific, a specific strategic time. Chronos is a season or a progression of time. But that's versing versus kairos, which is a shift to an opportune suddenly. Now, most of us live our Christian life looking for suddenlies. We just want the Lord to just come in and fix it and change it and heal it and show himself. And we, we want those, those glorious, wonderful suddenlies. Now, here's the truth. Most suddenlies don't happen unless there's been a whole lot of chronos, a whole lot of doing, a whole lot of praying, a whole lot of 
holding on, a whole lot of crying out to God. We, we see the, 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 the moment happen and we go, wow, wasn't that great? And maybe you got in on it by having a little prayer that steps into a situation just before the fact that God steps in and does something great. But I want you to know this, most of those things happen because of of that long siege, that long intercession, that long continuing to cry out to God, being true, hanging in there, not sinning, not doubting, not, not wavering in faith, holding on. Those are the things that move the heart of God and change everything around us. So don't get tired of doing what is good. Can I, can I give you a definition just a little bit to understand? Um, if, if you're a farmer... How many of you got gardens? Can I see anybody got gardens? Oh, five, six, seven of you. That's great. When you plant the seed and then you water it and then you weed it and then you fertilize it and then you water it and you weed it, that's chronos. Do you realize you got to do all of that, right? To get to kairos. And what is kairos? All of a sudden... The fruit's there. It's like when you pick that first zucchini, first yellow squash, first tomatoes on the vine. That's a kairos moment. But you couldn't have had a kairos moment if you hadn't had a chronos, right? How many of you folks have, I got to say, well, you ladies, how many of you ladies have been pregnant? Can I see your hand? Have you been pregnant? Yeah. Hey, in this house, men don't get pregnant. Sorry. I don't care what it does out there. There's truth in this house. Only women get pregnant. Some of you women probably wish we men would get pregnant. We'd be a whole lot more understanding. But from the time of conception all the way through the big, big belly growing, the throwing up and regurgitating for the months, if not Many months, the pain, the discomfort, the stretch marks, all of that is chronos. But do you know this, that a suddenly will surely take place. And suddenly the baby is coming. That's the Kairos moment. It's real important that we understand and actually uh, are grateful for the chronos time, for the hanging in there for the being faithful until because both phases, phases are very critical and they've got to be properly discerned where we are we're about to come into in our world Kairos moments where there's going to be things that have been prayed for for a long time sought after, interceded over and things are about to change now, I made a proclamation Wednesday night, and I want to say it here again for all of you who have sons and daughters and people that you love, dearest friends who are not saved. You have been, you have been interceding. You have been hanging true. You've been holding on. And not only you, but others have prayed. I want you to hear this. I declare to you, get ready for the prodigals to come home. Get ready for the prodigals to come home. Get ready. <laughs> For the prodigals to come home. It's about to become a Kairos moment. You say, I, I don't know how. Well, just, just look. Just believe me. God's, God adds to those moments when he decides things are going to be. And, and the, the, the faithfulness of people to do what they're supposed to do that causes sometimes to be weary. Galatians says, don't be weary in the chronos. Don't be weary in the intercession. Don't, don't get discouraged because as you invest, as you continue, there will come a moment in time where God's going to turn things around. And, and it just becomes a part of his timing. I, I don't know how to say it, but you've got to be willing to pray and delay prayer sieges. The Apostle Paul, you know, he was a pretty mean character for years and uh, actually persecuted the church. His name was Saul at the time. God changed his name when a Kairos moment happened and God pulled on Saul and brought him into the king, made him Paul. I thought it was really neat, one of the memes in Facebook the other day is, isn't it amazing that when Paul entered heaven, the people that were clapping and receiving him the most were the ones that he'd murdered. But when God called him, he didn't just step in and say, okay, I know all about it. I've been, I've been trained. I'm a great 
I'm a great, you know, study of the word. Now I understand Jesus' fulfillment. I'll just preach it. He spent 12 years in Bible college. 12 years preparing and, and 12 years into his faithful study and doing all that, the Lord said, separate to me Paul and Barnabas to do this work. Kairos happened out of chronology. I, I don't know if you know this. Some of you are so young, you know, Jaden can't understand this and Brody, but, but between 1940 and the 1980s, during those 40 years, the world was under communism, and I don't know that we have any really idea how many millions, or if not that, at least hundreds of thousands of people cried out and prayed for God to deliver this world from communism. Germany was split right in two, and you had a West and East Germany, and you had a great wall that was there, the wall that separated freedom from from the, the people who lived under communism. It's amazing that in our, in our world today we have idiot young people who weren't there during this time who think somehow communism, socialism would be nice for us to have. But you know, for four, over 40 years, people cried out to God and laid siege to bring the walls down. And I'll never forget when, when our President Reagan tear that wall down and communism ended its great it's great onslaught against life. We're, we're seeing some things now with, with, with Russia and, you know, attack against the Ukraine people. And, and we, we've never seen that kind of thing. But, but we lived in it. I, I lived in the Cold War days and down in, in Miami or Florida City where the, the rockets were set up right outside our house aimed for Cuba. Because Russia and, and communism had brought Russia, uh, 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 rockets into the, that little island just off the coast of, of Miami that could have bombed the United States. I, I lived through those days of fear. But we prayed and prayed and prayed and prayed, and God brought those walls down. I think the same is true with, with what happened with the, the Roe versus Wade situation. Guys, you understand, for 50 years, America killed its babies without any compromise, without any thought of conviction because of an absolute stupid um, decree that came out of an ungodly Supreme Court. And that thing went on for 50 years. I, I've been in that position of being arrested and crying out and standing in the weather of all kinds of weather with red tape over my mouth with just the word life written on it. I, I've, I've been there. I've done that. So many of you have. We prayed and cried and, and continued to do so. And we didn't think a, a Kairos moment would come, but it came. This last year, it just came. And it's, it's just the beginning of, of God saying, I'm going to stop this thing that's that's happening, but why do you think it happened? Because somebody decided to pray in January? It happened because 50 years ago people were praying, because people laid their lives on the line, because they took the long siege and said, we're going we're gonna to hang in there and we're not going to be weary in well-doing because in due time, it'll pay off. After my, my studies about... 12.30 last night, and we got to bed early, really did, because I, it's usually, Saturday night is usually 1 or 2 in the morning. But when I get my notes finished and, and uh, print my notes and uh, post them to the Dropbox that we have so that our guys can have it first thing Sunday morning and put it into the, the machine and, and get them ready for y'all and then come here and print the notes in the morning. In doing all of that, the last thing I do before I go to bed is just I just kind of Look at my notes and say, God, you know, talk to me tonight while I'm asleep. Anything you want to add, anything you want to handle here, that's great. And just before I went to bed and closed the book, the Lord just said to me, and look, I'll, I'll be honest with you, I, don't, I can't tell you this always happens. In fact, very rare does it happen. But I felt the Lord say to me something last night. He said, comfort. You. Comfort the people. You comfort, comfort my people. So immediately I laid down in bed. And I go, I know this is scripture. Where is it? I can't remember where it is. I look it up. Hey Siri, where is comfort ye comfort me, the people? Poof, Isaiah 40. Israel has just been through hell. And it's very prophetic, guys, by the way. Let me just tell you once again. If you would just have a bent toward, as I do, looking at scriptures that prophetically talk about Jesus returning. Isaiah 40 is about Jesus returning. 
is about what he's going to do for Israel during the last week of years, during tribulation time, as he brings Israel back to himself. But it is that in that passage in chapter 40, at the, at the end, the very last verse, verse 1 is comfort. Mark, you comfort my people. Verse 31 says, because they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They'll mount up with wings as eagles. They'll run and not be weary. They'll walk and not faint. And I thought, okay, you got to help me, Lord, because I want to comfort the people today. I don't want to stress you. I want to tell you that you have battled well. You, 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 you've hung in there. You, you're loving Jesus. You're, you're working to serve him with all of your heart. And all of us know we, we need to wake up. We all know that it's easy to be lulled to sleep. We all know that the enemy is lying and cheating, deceiving. We all know the world is messed up and screwed up. And we're just watching it burn up. And we're wondering what in the world can we do. And I'm here to tell you, hang on. Do not become weary in, in well-doing. I'm here to tell you that we have laid seeds for a long, long time and things are about to change. Things are about to transfer into the kingdom's hand. Be strong in the power of his might. What is his mighty power? The same power that was a part of Jesus' life and ministry, in fact, the center part of his life here on earth is the same power that's afforded to all of us to live it and to hang on to it and to hold on to it and to not be so weary and heavy and laden and burdened that we give up, we, we flesh out, we, 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 we throw it all away. No, 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 no. I'm, I'm encouraging you today because the power of his might is the power of the Holy Spirit and the same Holy Spirit that filled Jesus, that worked in Jesus' life. In fact, even the same Holy Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead, according to the word, is yours to abide in you, to live in you, and the power of the Holy Spirit will be the only thing that holds us right now. Hear me. Just, just hear me for a moment. I'm telling you, we're in the calm before the storm. Things are about to happen in our world. I, I can't tell you what. I just know they are. And the working of God's Holy Spirit in you is the only keeping power that you need to be sane and to make it through what's coming real soon. I'm asking you to hear me enough to realize the truth of the word that Ephesians says, that we can be empowered by the Holy Spirit, that we can be strong in the Lord and his mighty power. Now, how do we know it's the Holy Spirit? Look with, the, with me at these scriptures. Acts chapter 10. Verse 38, it says, And you know that God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit. You say, but Jesus was God, so he just did everything because he was God. No, he was fully man, disrobed of his divinity or his power to do anything in the flesh. He was a man that was flesh. He did die, he was resurrected, he did get a transformed body, and he is now at the right hand of the Father. And that, that supernatural being that we know as the resurrected Christ is different from the man that walked here, but the man who walked here, who was Jesus, had to have power to do the things that he did. This is what he had to do the things that he did. Read it again, verse 38. And you know that God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power. Then Jesus went around doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. God the Spirit, God the Holy Spirit was with Jesus and empowered him to do the works, the signs, and the wonders, the miracles that he did. Luke chapter 4. Listen to this. Jesus is here at the beginning of his ministry. It says, then Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit. Do you remember what had happened? He was baptized. Heaven portal opened up. The dove came down, or the Holy Spirit like a dove, and, and he was filled with the Holy Spirit. He, the Holy Spirit came upon him. And it says, then Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan River. He was led by the Spirit into the wilderness. Where he was tempted by the devil for 40 days. And then you read the rest of those verses. It talks about the, you know, the, the story of how the devil came to him three different times and tried to get him to sin. 
And in the power of the Holy Spirit, he rose up with the power of the word, spoke the word, defeated the enemy. And verse 14 says, then Jesus returned to Galilee, filled with the Spirit's power. Let me tell you this. The the Holy Spirit can't be deterred or hindered or slighted by the fact that the enemy is trying to defeat us. We come under a battle often. But I'll be honest with you, you can more often come out of that battle more full of the Holy Spirit than you went in with the Holy Spirit. Because the Holy Spirit is going to infuse you with his presence and his power and his grace and his love and his conviction and his, 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 the reward of, of, of relationship with God. He's going to talk to you. He's going to hold you. He's going to love you. He's going to handle the evil that you're going through so that you walk out. You walk out more empowered than you went in. Well, only three of you believe that, but I'm, I believe it anyway. And then the Bible says he went into the tabernacle or into the temple. And look what he says. He said, the spirit of the Lord is upon me for he's anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim that captives will be released, that the blind will see, that the oppressed will be set free. And that the time of the Lord's favor has come. I don't know about you, but that, that declaration of Jesus is pretty powerful, right? Jesus is gone. He's in the heavenlies. Now he comes to fill you with the same Holy Spirit. Jesus actually said, it is imperative that I go. If I don't go, the Holy Spirit will not come. But if I go, I'm going to send the Holy Spirit. And he's going to fill you up with the same power that he filled me up with. And he's going to give you the same power so that, listen to this, so that you'll be my witnesses and you'll declare the kingdom of heaven in Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria, the uttermost parts of the world. And these signs shall follow those that believe in my name. They will do great exploits. They will see miracles, signs, and wonders. There'll be protection on their life. They'll drink deadly things. It won't hurt them. They'll, 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 they'll get, a snake will come to bite them and it'll, it'll not harm them. But I will give them the power to do miracles and signs and wonders and healing. Do you believe that? So then hear me, I want you to know that the declaration that Jesus made is a declaration you need to make every day of your life when you wake up. As you face the world, you need to say, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me, and He's anointed me to preach this powerful message of freedom and deliverance to my world, and I'm going to go in the power and the anointing of the Holy Spirit. And when people look at you crazy saying, and this day that Scripture is being fulfilled in your very presence because the Holy Spirit dwells in you. Whoa, that's pretty heavy. Yeah, it is. It's pretty heavy. It's pretty great. Acts 1 8, if you don't believe it, but you shall receive power. Kind of paraphrase it a little bit. But you will receive the same power of the Holy Spirit that Jesus had. But you will receive power and ability, is the Amplified Bible, when the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you will be my witnesses. Missionary who uh, spent his life in missions in his later years retirement became a Bible college professor. His name was Herbert Jackson. Herbert had gone to several missions fields, and one of his last one, this is years and years ago, when he got there, the older, older missionary who was retiring said, Well, the old car I got here for your transportation is, is shot. He said, it will not crank. But what you can do is get some people to push it or you can park this on a hill and let it coast and pop the clutch and it'll crank every time. Now I know for some of you that is, first of all, completely foreign because you don't even know what a clutch is. And you can't imagine cranking a car by letting it run down the hill and, and popping the clutch. I grew up with a, in a VW Bug. And I promise you, if it didn't crank, I could push it off by myself, jump in, pop the clutch, and, uh, and, and let it crank. Here we go. I think it ought to be a normal part of life that somewhere every human being that drives has to learn how to drive a stick shift. I agree. I know, I know, that's old-fashioned and all the rest of you, but I believe that everybody needs to know that. Probably after the EMPs fall, the only old cars that are going to drive are the old ones that have a clutch. 
and don't have all the electronics in them. So back to my story. So this old missionary in this South American town had this little car, and, and after he got it cranked the first time, he devised a plan and for the two years that he was there, he would never park the car that it wasn't on a hill. Or if he couldn't find a hill, he'd leave the car running and go do what he had to do. Back then, I guess gas was cheap enough. In fact, when I was a kid and sold gas, our gas was 27 cents a gallon. And there were some people who would only come in and buy five gallons. And you'd have to pump it and clean their windshield front and back and sweep their floor if they wanted it, all for a dollar and a quarter. Well, he was pretty close to the end of his ministry anyway and on, on the mission field. And so when he left, a young man came in to take his place, and he was passing the car off to him. And he said, sorry, but this is the only transportation, and it's just uh, it was one of those things. And the young man said, well, let me look at it. And he popped the hood. He said, oh, I don't know. He said, uh, looks to me like there's just a bad connection here to the battery. So he twisted it off and scraped it and put the thing back on, tightened it up and turned the key and it went and cranked right up. And for two years, that missionary had pushed that car off, run it down the mountainsides, and all the time the power was there. It was just a loose connection. I don't need to apply this, do I? Do you understand? The power of God is available to us. In fact, Ephesians chapter 1, verse 19 and 20 in the J.B. Phillips paraphrase says, How tremendous is the power available to us who believe in God. Let me read it for you in the New Living Translation. He says, I also pray that you will understand the incredible greatness of God's power for us. The RSV says, in us. J.B. Phillips says, available to us who believe in him. The power of God is available to us to work in us and to work through us. I already read to you or quoted, but John 16, 7, but in fact, it is best for you that I go away because if I don't, the advocate won't come. If, he do, if I do go away, then I will send him to you, the advocate. The word in Greek is paraclete, paraclete. I'm almost done, but I want you to hear this. Paraclete means one who is our comforter, encourager, counselor, intercessor, strengthener, standby. The Holy Spirit is all that we have need of to wake and fight and have strength. You cannot fight without the strength of the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit comes to be in you and to flow through you. He wants, Holy Spirit wants to be your comforter. He wants to encourage you, wants to strengthen you. And you need to every moment of every day pray, Holy Spirit, fill me up. Fullness today. I want all of you, God, in me. And Holy Spirit comes to do just that. The word paraclete is a unique word. I didn't know this. But in my study, I found out that the word paraclete is a military word. The Greek soldiers, when they went to battle, always put men to fighting two by two. And they would always fight so that one person would fight this way and the other person would fight to your back. And the person that fought to your back was your paraclete. Here's the truth. The Holy Spirit has come and he's got your back. You understand that? He's the greatest partner you'll ever have, and he comes to give you his power and to flow through you and to flow in you. Romans chapter 8, verse 26, and the Holy Spirit helps us in our weakness. For example, we don't know what God wants us to even pray for, but the Holy Spirit prays for us or with us with groanings that cannot be expressed in words. The Bible in basic English says, and in the same way the Spirit is a help to our feeble hearts, but the Spirit helps, the Spirit puts our desires into words which are not in our power to say. Okay, let me just, let me just be basic, foundational here with you to say, bottom line, listen to me, you can't even pray without the Holy Spirit. I'll tell you, prayer becomes wearisome quick. 
if the Holy Ghost ain't helping you, helping you pray. And if you're like me, I can begin to pray in English for an issue and a situation, and one of two things are going to happen. I'll say something that keys my brain into a different thought, and all of a sudden my mind is wandering, and I'm going someplace that I wasn't even supposed to go just because of the English words. Sometimes I pray, and I get to praying for somebody, and my own thoughts uh, jump in, and I start thinking about how they've messed up, screwed up, how unfaithful they've been, how wearisome they are, and next thing I know, I'm not being good for them at all because I'm praying out of my own spirit instead of the Holy Spirit. But I'll be honest with you, the Holy Spirit can pray with you and through you with such an anointing that he can help you pray and pray and pray and lay siege and cry out to God more than you talk on the phone, more than you write on your phone, uh, in your texting, in your Facebooking, in your Instagramming, all of the thoughts you've got about a situation. You can pray more than you do all those things in the power of the Holy Spirit. The word helps. I wrote the Greek transliteration out. Anybody want to try to say it for me? It's, anybody want to say it? <laughs> okay, I've, I've, I read all of my words last week in Greek, and I thought when I got done, there's going to surely be somebody that's going to see it on, on YouTube and say, that guy don't know how to say Greek words. So I'm not even going to try this one. No, I, I will. It's as soon anti labano may I. That's not right, but it's something like that. It's actually made up of, of four or three or four words. You'll see soon, S-Y-N, it, it, the word soon means together. Anti is against. In fact, here's what it means, to take hold of, together with, against. The Holy Spirit helps us, and what does the Holy Spirit do? He takes a hold of us. I don't know about you, but when I'm praying, I need the Holy Ghost to hold me. Because I feel like I go into places sometimes of battle that are hard to pray about, except the Holy Spirit's there holding me. But he not only takes a hold of me, he takes hold of the problem with me. So he takes a hold of, together with, against the enemy, the situation, the, the stuff we're battling. So the Holy Spirit is with us, and that means he is right with us. I mean, with us all the way. And so the imperative is that you need to understand that even though God's God and can do anything he wants to do, he has chosen not to do anything that he doesn't do with you. So as we pray, God moves. As we cry out to God, then the Lord steps into a situation and is able to do something tremendous. He helps us. I heard a story of an elephant and a mouse, and they were best friends. I don't remember, if, I don't know if you remember the story of the, of the, the mouse. Is it the mouse and the lion and... He took the thorn out of the lion's paw or something. Yeah. Well, this is similar, but it's the story of a mouse and an elephant. And they were such best buds that the, the mouse would ride on the elephant everywhere. And he just thought himself such a big shot because he was always higher than everybody else and was on his buddy, right? They hung out together. And one day they crossed a wooden bridge and as the elephant and the mouse crossed the bridge, the, the bridge creaked and shook and trembled and swayed a little bit. And they got across the other side. And the mouse up on top of the elephant, impressed that they made it across, said to the elephant, we sure shook that bridge, didn't we? You and the Holy Spirit, there's no limit to what can be done. And you will realize the more you set your, your face to fight, to siege, to come against, to hang in there, to cry out to God, you'll realize if anything is ever accomplished and done, it's not because of your weight. You did cross the bridge, but you crossed the bridge on the back of the Holy Spirit. 
Now here's the point. Listen to me. The Holy Spirit won't go across the bridge without you. But you want to see something happen? Then lay siege by the power of the Holy Spirit. So I was ready to step out of the house today and uh, had showered and brushed my teeth and combed my hair and was trying to get all pretty for y'all. All the time I was in the, the shower, all the time I was getting ready this morning, I was just hearing the Lord say, comfort, comfort, comfort the people, comfort the people. And you know, I, I will go over time today because Marcus is sitting right in front of the clock and I cannot see what time it is. <laughs> and I appreciate it, Marcus. I guess I'll, I'll know when the... <laughs> Thank you. I, I got nine minutes. So I started to walk out the door. I said, God, I'm, I'm, I'm incapable of comforting the people. What do I, what do I say to a... Dolores and Angelo who aren't here, there's been a, a week in hell this week with a, a sore on this, young, on this man's backside because he's crippled and sitting in a chair laying on a bed all his, all his life and he's always getting these terrible sores. A sore that got so bad and the doctors wouldn't see him and wouldn't fix it and they went to the emergency room and spent all night an emergency room only for them finally come in the early morning and say, we've got to do surgery on you. And they said, well, it's what we've wanted from the beginning. And they had to cut so deeply that what was once a small wound became big enough that she said, I could put my whole fist in it where they took all of the meat and the flesh off of his side. And he said, she said, you can see all the way down to the bone. They literally scraped and cut away bone. Angelo, though he's crippled, was in terrible pain, cried and said, there's got to be an answer. We prayed, we sought the Lord, we cried out, we claimed the miracles of by his stripes were healed. And, and do believe the Lord is going to heal Angelo. Talking to Dolores yesterday, she said, she said, my buddy's doing better and he's not hurting. And, and we're waiting on the Lord just to fix it. And we got antibiotics going into him intravenously with a pick line. She said, she said, Angela looked up at me last night and she said, he said, sweetheart, I, I think I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to not go to church tomorrow if that's okay with you. It takes them two hours just to get him up and ready and bring him to church on Sunday. They live almost 45 minutes away. And he was having to apologize for not being able to come to church this morning John and Susie are sick real sick been sick for a week 10 days Tristan's not here he'd be amen in me out of his wheelchair how am I going to comfort people what if the bottom does fall out soon what if what if things come to an end what what's our answer and the Lord said Tell them to hide in the rock. Run to the rock. I knew about that, right? So I said, okay, Lord, give me the scripture. Psalms 51, excuse me, 61. Oh God, listen to my cry, hear my prayer. From the ends of the earth I cry to you for help. When my heart is overwhelmed, lead me to the towering rock of safety. For you are my safe refuge, a fortress where my enemies cannot reach me. Let me live forever in your sanctuary, safe beneath the shelter of your wings. And in Psalm 62, I wait quietly before God. For my victory comes from him. He alone is my rock and my salvation. My fortress, there I will never be shaken. Let all that I am wait quietly before God. Let all that I am wait quietly before God, for my hope is in Him. He alone is my rock and my salvation, my fortress where I will not be shaken. My victory and honor come from God alone. He is my refuge, a rock where no enemy can reach me. O oh, my people, trust in Him at all times. Pour out your heart to Him, for God is our refuge. Look up rock. 
Get all the scriptures and Psalms. David knew what it was to hide in the Lord. And I don't know what else to leave you with today but to tell you he is your rock. He is your mighty fortress. He is your strong tower. You can run into him and be safe. You can be victorious. You can lay siege. And the Kronos time is going to turn to a Kairos any moment. And if the world shakes and falls apart, you will be hidden in the shelter of his hand. In the cleft of the rock, he'll put his hand on you and protect you. He is the rock of your salvation. Amen. Amen.